Welcome to our exploration of linseed oil mills in Amesbury before 1825. The 1792 description of Amesbury mills mentions two mills powered by the powwow that were used to process flaxseed into linseed oil. You will notice that it looks like linfeed because the S inside a word at this time was similar to an F except that the horizontal component did not pass through the vertical the way it does in five in the line above. The description tells us that they were on the Powwow River, but where on the river is not mentioned, so part of the job of understanding them is finding them. The 1825 map of the situation of the nail factory and the ironworks shows it what the Powwow looked like about 30 years after the 1792 description. If we look closely at the first dam on the left, we can see that across from the old ironworks, the 1825 map shows a small unidentified building on an island. There is an earlier map from 1809, which is more crudely drawn and harder to read. It is also oriented differently. On this map too, there are two islands in the powwow. The one on the right is of interest. If we focus on the building on the island in the 1825 map, and then look at the right-hand island on the 1809 map, and then turn the 1825 map upside down, we can see the similarity. And looking more closely, we can read on the 1809 map, it is called Oil Mill Island, right across from the old ironworks. So we have found the first oil mill. But what might it have looked like? The 1825 map shows it as a small building, perhaps the size of the building that housed the Prawl oil mill built in 1790 in Stockton, New Jersey. What about the other oil mill? No map for that. But we do have a deed from May 21st, 1811, in which Jacob Morrill transfers to his sons uh, Jacob and Jonathan, ownership of a property and an oil mill privilege, that is, a right to use a certain amount of water to power a mill, shared equally with Joshua Follinsby. And where is it? Since here is where we can find it. As the deed says, northerly by the Powwow River, easterly by said Powwow River, southerly by a road which leads from the head of the tidewaters in said river to the county road, and westerly by land here and after mentioned. That previously mentioned land contains a sawmill and a grist mill, two more of the mills enumerated in the 1792 description of the Powwow River. So we have found our oil mills at either end of the Powwow Falls, one powered by the first dam, the other powered by the last. Linseed oil comes from the flax plant, and flax plants are used to make linen cloth as well as linseed oil. To harvest flax for both cloth and seed, after the seeds mature, the plants are pulled up from the ground rather than cut off to preserve the longest possible fibers. A nasty looking device called a rippling cone is used to separate out the seeds. But why make linseed oil? Linseed oil is a drying agent used to create oil paint and window caulk and to protect wood. Ready mixed paint became available after around 1870. Before that time, paint would be mixed in usable batches on the spot, as described in this ad from the Amesbury paper that advertised pigment sold by the barrel. Uh, Six dollars for a 300 pound barrel which, as the ad notes, would supply a farmer for years to come. Probably not next day delivery from New York either. Joseph Merrill notes in his History of Amesbury that those who painted the West Meeting House used linseed oil derived from 33 and two-thirds bushels of flaxseed. Since on average in the early oil mills, a bushel produced a little less than two gallons, they needed about 62 gallons to paint the building. Not a surprise, 
since the West Meeting House is a big building. Today we call it the Rocky Hill Meeting House on Elm Street. In addition, Merrill also points out how widespread the cultivation of flax was in our area and that linseed oil was made at home as well as in Amesbury. But why build oil mills on the banks of the Pow Wow River? How does linseed oil manufacturing use water power? There are four steps involved in making linseed oil. The harvested seeds are, are cleaned by eliminating debris. The clean seeds are crushed to break open the hulls forming an oily paste. The crushed seeds are heated to about 240 degrees Fahrenheit to make the oil more liquid. The heated crushed seeds are pressed to extract the oil and the left behind oil cake goes through crushing, cooking and pressing again before being used for animal feed. The falling weight of water powers the water wheel by turning it. The resulting movement can be circular using gears to make the circle vertical or horizontal, parallel or perpendicular to the flow of the water. Gears can also make the motion go up and down, using water's fall to raise up and the Earth's gravity to pull down. The seeds are cleaned not by washing, but by sorting out the debris that is not seed. It is worth uh, doing this because the fewer impurities left in the meal cake produced at the end of the process, the more valuable it is as livestock feed. One way to sort flaxseed in bulk is using a roller screen. This screened cylinder, covered in two different kinds of screen, rotates at an angle. The seed and debris, sticks and leaves and flecks of organic matter are poured into the upper end. The fine screens of the first section eliminates the tiny particles in the mix. The material slides down the cylinder into the next screen, which is sized to allow flax seeds to fall through where they are collected. The larger debris slides out the bottom end. This is a working reproduction of the rolling screen at George Washington's Mount Vernon farm. Another device to accomplish the same task is the fanning mill, which uses the circular motion to turn a fan. The order of sorting is slightly different. As the grain falls through the coarse screens, the fan blows away the fines, the smallest and lightest particles. The flaxseed slide off the finest screen and out the machine. The fan can be cranked by hand. But was also powered by water. The second step was crushing the seed to crack open the husks. Here the water power was used to turn a cam that would lift an iron-tipped stamping pole that would then drop onto the flax seed in a mortar. The pole was about 18 feet long. Notice that it goes up through the ceiling. It took about 10 minutes to reduce the seed to an oily meal. The operator would then pull the rope attached to a lever that pushed against a peg to disengage the pole from the cam and allow access to the mortar cavity to clear it out. This is the kind of crushing machine that a small oil mill would use, though they would likely have more than one working off the same shaft. Machines like this were generally built on the spot. Larger linseed oils might have used edge runner millstones like this one. The need for three millstones and the robust supporting structure and gearing required would have made this a significant investment. The next step is heating the crushed seeds to about 240 degrees to make the oil easier to extract. At the time of our mills, the cooking would be done over a wood fire. Burning the seeds reduced the amount of oil that could be extracted. The constant stirring of this machine would keep that from happening. Once again, pulling down on a rope raises a lever that disengages the wooden gear at the top, and thus the stirring device is lifted out of the hot seeds, which are ready for the final step. What looks like a pan 
is often a bottomless ring that would be slid off depositing the meal into a container. The pressing of the hot crushed flaxseed, the fourth step, was performed with a wedge press, which uses the trip hammer again, paired with a wedge to apply intense pressure to the flaxseed mush. To get a sense of the scale, the stamping rods are 13 feet long, six by six inch beams. They are lifted and dropped on the, uh, on the wedge in the compartment below, usually striking it 40 to 60 times over 10 to 15 minutes, squeezing out the oil into the pan below. Before going into the compartment, the crushed cooked flaxseed is put in cloth bags inside leather wrappers. Then these packages, along with angled spacer blocks, a pressing wedge, and a releasing wedge, are placed between iron plates and inserted into the compartment below the stamping rod. We were interested in how this mechanism worked, so Larry Pearl constructed a model with its, with its point downward uh, when the pressing wedge is struck, it tightens the assembly. Um, when its beam strikes the releasing wedge with its point upward and a striking pad on top, it breaks the pressure and allows the assembly to be removed. After some experimenting, Larry discovered that the key is that the releasing wedge is perpendicular on one side and angled on the other. The Statement of the Arts and Manufactures of the United States of America for the year 1810, published in 1813, shows only two linseed oil mills in Essex County, most likely the Amesbury-Salisbury mills that processed about 24,200 pounds of flaxseed. This is not much compared to the western counties of Massachusetts. The farming counties in western Massachusetts raised more flax and therefore produced more seeds and produced more oil. They also had more use for meal cake to feed livestock. That year it turned out that we in Amesbury, Salisbury produced less than 2% of the state's output of linseed oil. Until around 1820, flax was grown in America primarily to be spun into linen cloth. This homespun was produced at home from flax grown on an acre or so of land, as Merrill noted was the case here. As you can see from the data, in 1810, more cloth was made in the United States from linen than from cotton. However, the future is rearing its head because in 1810, Massachusetts produced 36 yards of cotton, 36,000 yards of cotton in manufacturing establishments. In the 1820s, cheap cotton will spell the end of linen as a staple for clothing a family, since the elaborate process of creating it resisted automation, and buying the inexpensive cotton produced in the growing number of textile mills in Great Britain and the United States made more sense than growing, pulling, rippling, redding, breaking, scutching, hackling, and spinning the fibers. That's all before even beginning to weave. As the 19th century advanced, flax was grown in the U.S. primarily for the seeds. Uh, in addition, whatever seed was available would need to compete with the export market. This Newburyport merchant, located on the wards, wharves, advertising in 1795, was not intending to make linseed oil, but to export the flax seed. Irish linen was renowned for its quality partly because they would pull the, seed, the flax before it went to seed. The Irish looked to the U.S. for its high-quality flaxseed. Linseed oil production, the slow, lo, lo, small local industry, could easily be pushed out by the water-hungry behemoth of the textile industry slouching toward Amesbury. As in so many cases, Amesbury's and Salisbury Mills' proximity to the coast meant that as the town industrialized and local products disappeared, they had access to other sources, including imported goods. So, the increased availability of cheap cotton cloth, both imported and manufactured, 
reduced the amount of linen being made in Amesbury homes, and as a result, less flax is grown and fewer seeds produced. With the supply of seeds drying up, local linseed oil production becomes more difficult and expensive, and oil mills become less profitable. Using a mill privilege to power a textile mill would realize a much higher return than an oil mill would. As textile mills proliferate, cheap cotton becomes even more available. If you are a cotton manufacturer, this is a virtuous cycle. If you are a linseed oil manufacturer, it is a vicious circle that will ultimately lead to the end of linseed oil manufacturing in early Amesbury and this presentation.